Good afternoon. My name is Jessica Evans, and I have the privilege of serving as Director of Major Gifts for the Tri-State Region and Eastern Pennsylvania in the Office of University Development at the University of Michigan. On behalf of my Tri-State colleagues, Ann Orloff, Sarah Michaels, and Annie Bell, I'd like to warmly welcome you all today, and thank you for joining us for the first ever virtual Michigan in Manhattan a series of events for our local supporters and friends that we launched last year. Whether you're joining us from Manhattan or anywhere else in the tri-state region, we're so glad you could join us today. We have a tremendously timely and relevant topic lined up for today, but before I introduce our donor host, let me just go over a few housekeeping items. We have allocated ample time for Q&A and I think you're gonna have some pretty good questions given the nature of our topic. So I encourage you to submit your questions for our speaker. To ask questions for the Q&A portion, please type your questions in the Q&A window at any time during the event. We have the chat function available for comments or technical support if you need it. And since we're in the Zoom webinar format, I recognize that we can't all see each other today. So if you'd like to take a moment at any time to introduce yourself to the group, please use the chat function to type your name, where you live, and your affiliation with Michigan, such as your graduation year and the degree that you hold. Just be a really nice way for everyone to get a sense of who's in the room today. We also recommend that you select speaker view in the top right corner for the best viewer experience. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Michael Hefter. Michael is a partner and trial lawyer at Hogan Lovells in New York. He serves as a bet the company lawyer who is sought by clients to handle high profile and sensitive matters and for the purposes of taking cases to trial with decades of experience leading clients through complex jury and bench trials in federal and state courts. A graduate of the College of Literature, Science and the Arts with a major in political science and also as a Michigan parent now, Michael is a longtime friend of and volunteer for the University of Michigan and serves on the LSA Political Science Advisory Board. Michael, it's a pleasure to have you here today and I'll hand it over to you to introduce our speaker. Thank you very much, Jessica. And I'm honored to be here as a graduate of the university in 1988 with a degree in political science and as a member of the Political Science Advisory Board currently. Um, certainly, this election is probably unprecedented in, in our lifetimes, as we all could imagine. And just when you thought that uh, everything is stable, uh, which is an overstatement, there's another curveball or development in the world that presents a curveball to all of our conventional thinking. Um, so it's going to be interesting. Uh, but obviously, you do not want to hear from me, and you want to hear from Professor Brader today, our esteemed uh, guest. Professor Brader is a political science professor at the university. And he's also a research professor in the Center for Political Studies at Michigan's Institute for Social Research, where he has taught for 20 years. He currently serves as principal investigator of the American National Election Studies, the longest running and most heavily used scientific data collection on politics in the world. His own research focuses on the role of emotions in politics, something we all are experiencing these days, political partisanship. Again, we've seen that um, in our lifetimes, immediate effects on public opinion, experimental and survey methods and other topics in political uh, psychology. He's the author of Campaigning for Hearts and Minds and numerous scientific articles. By far, his favorite course is a seminar he offers most years for U of M seniors entitled, Are Americans Good Citizens? He's a graduate summa cum laude from Dartmouth College and received his PhD from Harvard University. So without further ado, uh, Professor Brader, take it away. All right, thanks so much, Michael, and, um, and thanks to Jessica. Uh, and everyone else for uh, inviting me to participate in um, uh, the conversation today. I'm looking forward to it. Um, and uh, and so um, <clears throat> there is uh, so much happening in, in our politics and um, and uh, about the election specifically. Uh, so many things we could 
uh, could talk about. And I'm happy to talk about pe any questions people have. They don't have to be related to the stuff I'm going to show you. I'm going to kick things off by talking about a couple of topics close to my own research, uh, just to give you some food for thought on that. Um, and, but I'm happy to talk about things beyond that. I was a little afraid to uh, to uh, look at the news this morning, to be honest, because things happen so quickly. I have to come up with something uh, else to uh, respond to. Um, but I'm going to start by uh, drawing our attention to two uh, distinct ways emotions factor into our politics and especially into our elections. And uh, so normally, where politics is concerned, people are mostly distracted with their daily lives, their homes, their work, their family. Um, and large parts of the American public are usually quite disinterested in uh, the nuts and bolts of politics, and they're only intermittently attentive to public affairs. Um, those tuning in today, those who take my classes, might be more the exceptions, people who have a strong interest in, in politics. There are some of those, but a large parts of the public are not. Um, and so presidential elections uh, tend to function as emotional high tides of politics. Um, and with all that um, is happening lately, as, as Michael said, you might feel this is an understatement. It feels a bit more like a tsunami of emotion this year. Um, but I'll, I want to say a few words about the regular ebb and flow of, of emotion and then kind of why the, the surf is so high lately. And so historically, election campaigns have served um, to wake up a, a kind of slumbery, uh, slumbering electorate. Uh, the primary seasons rouse the activists and the most attentive of voters early in the year. Conventions whip up and harden the resolve of the party faithful in the summer. And then by the fall general election with rallies and endless advertisements and people knocking on doors and debates, uh, this awakens the remaining mass of would-be voters. Um, and so this is kind of the ritual of our elections. An important part of what the campaigns do is bring out the emotions that will help voters pay attention, uh, make decisions, and get to the polls. Um, and that's because emotions, um, as we currently understand them in contemporary psychology and social sciences, are central to human functioning. Although they can be inconvenient and lead us astray from time to time, they are critical to our reasoning and to uh, modulating our behavior appropriately to fit uh, whatever situation is at hand. And so I'm going to um, uh, talk about three specific emotions. Uh, there's a lot more emotions of that, but and it's some of the different implications for how we respond. And this is an area where my and several other political scientists research has focused in recent years. Uh, so for example, um, feelings of enthusiasm and pride, um, they re reinforce our habitual ways of doing um, and thinking. Uh, they um, um, uh, they uh, focus on, uh, oops, did the screen share stop? Oh, just gonna go back to that, I think. Um, uh, they, they focus on uh, giving us the energy to push on with our goals, uh, make us want to wave our, our kind of banner for all to see. That's, that's what we do when we're feeling proud, enthusiastic. Um, fear, on the other hand, is um, pushes a pause button on our habits. Um, and in political terms, we might think of our partisan habits in particular. Fear puts the pause button on, puts our attention on, on high alert for potential threats in our environment, uh, triggers our attention to the current details of the campaign or whatever's happening uh, right now, and invites us to reconsider how best to proceed. Um, and thus, it opens the doors to, uh, to persuasion uh, in some cases. Um, a third emotion, Anger uh, hardens our determination to stay the course, shuts down our, any interest we might have in compromise or considering alternative perspectives, gives us tremendous energy to fight for what we want and to punish those who stand in the way or would do us wrong. Um, and so campaigns often try to stir up these and other emotions at different times among different groups as they seek to mobilize supporters and sway those on the fence. This is a central part of campaign advertising, uh, in particular as, as part of the campaign that's really geared towards getting our emotions going and sustaining that over the course of the, the general election. And so um, I'm going to show you a few examples uh, for how the ads, uh, especially in the last several decades, have evolved uh, video advertisements um, to try to evoke these particular um, types of emotions. And so um, to keep things uh, somewhat neutral, I'm going to show you some ads from the past. 
Um, and, and, and I don't know about others, but I could use occasional breaks from the current election. Um, I'll, play, I'll play this ad and then I'm gonna come back and point out a couple things about it. Um, this is from Ronald Reagan's reelection campaign in 1984. And you may, some of you may have seen um, ads from, from that period in the past. In a town not too far from where you live, a young family has just moved into a new home. Three years ago, even the smallest house seemed completely out of reach. Right down the street, one of the neighbors just bought himself a new truck with all the options. The factory down by the river is working again. Not long ago, people were saying it would probably be closed forever. Just about every place you look, things are looking up. Life is better. America's back. And people have a sense of pride they never thought they'd feel again. And so it's not surprising that just about everyone in town is thinking the same thing. Now that our country is turning around, why would we ever turn back? Okay, so that ad delivers a very simple positive message on behalf of the Reagan campaign. Things are much better now than they were four years ago, so why not stick with the incumbent? That's the message of the ad. Um, but rather than just having a narrator or the candidate himself appear and deliver that message in a straightforward way, the ad um, wants to kind of reinforce that message with this cascade of music and imagery, images to kind of create an emotional feeling to draw us in and, and, and make us feel that message and not just, um, just hear it. And, and it's, of course, devoid of a lot of political substance. There's not a lot of talk about the details of policies or issue positions in this ad. It's, it's about feeling good about um, where the country is and what's happening. And, and you know, they use all kinds of um, ads and we can look through it just as a reminder, right? There's lots of nice looking neighborhoods and kids playing and, and um, people are moving into houses, which means they just were able to buy new houses and they bought new cars and they factories are um, going and, you know, everybody's smiling too, right? And so, uh, which is, you know, the, who wouldn't be smiling to be going to work and painting fences? Everybody smiles when they do that stuff, right? Houses being put up um, and, uh, and people eating ice cream and going to parades and, um, and, and of course, kids and American flags. Um, and so this is, this is good. It feels good and the nice, sweet, sentimental music. And so this is part of an effort to make us feel those, that pride, that, enth that enthusiasm for the way things are going in the, in the country. Um, and in 1984, there were a whole series of these ads um, and it was called the uh, Morning in America campaign that Reagan had. And they ran other kinds of ads, including some negative ads in that campaign. But the Morning in America ad campaign was a series of ads that riffed off this basic idea, different sense of imagery. And it became a sort of playbook for incumbent reelection campaigns. It kind of established that. There had been earlier stabs at this, but the Reagan people uh, more or less nailed it with this, uh, with this uh, design. And just to reinforce the kind of since you have that this is the playbook, I'm going to show you two other examples of, uh, from other campaigns. And so let's flash forward 12 years. Uh, there's a Democrat in the White House running for re-election, Bill Clinton, and here's one of his signature ads from that campaign. Oops. Won't go down. Let me say to you that I am honored to have been given the opportunity to stand up for the values and the interests of ordinary Americans. My job as president is to take care of the American people. And I have done my best to take good care of this country. We are safer, we are more secure, we are more prosperous. But in the end, what we stand for, the values we embrace and the things we fight for will shape the future that we will all live with. If we hold out our hands in cooperation, but always stand up for what we know is right, this country's future will be even brighter than its brilliant past. It is our responsibility to make that happen. Okay, 
interesting. So although the, the images and the music are just different, they are also kind of the same. Um, sweet, sentimental music, uh, uplifting in nature. We've got, a, again, lots of smiling um, faces, um, American flags, um, nice looking neighborhoods. So we throw in some kind of iconic uh, um, American landmarks with the Oval Office and the, and the Washington Monument in this ad. Um, uh, so it's, it's very similar. People, you know, again, once again, they're happily working, um, going to their homes and their churches and their, um, you even have um, uh, people putting up the house. It's once again, it's exactly the people um, lifting up the frame, the side of the house that's being built. Um, uh, and uh, the only difference here is uh, is people have a have a tighter haircut because it's the '90s, um, and so and so you can't do the the, the uh, one of the few differences in style in this ad is they put up some text on the screen occasionally to remind you of Clinton's policy initiatives and policy to Clinton, uh, well known as a Bill Clinton as a as a policy wonk, uh, he couldn't kind of resist that I think uh, putting up the the. Uh, the issues. So let's look at just one more example of this type of ad. Um, again, uh, we'll uh, rock it forward to 2012, um, Barack Obama in the White House, um, and um, this was an ad he produced, um, which again has its own wrinkle on things, but you'll notice the parallels. Every president inherits challenges. Few have faced so many. Four years later, our enemies have been brought to justice. Our heroes are coming home. Assembly lines are humming again. There are still challenges to me. Children to educate, a middle class to rebuild. But the last thing we should do is turn back now. I'm Barack Obama, and I approve this message. All right, so I don't even need to go back and show you. I'm sure you saw the wall going up, um, building the house. Uh, at this point, um, it, it must be an obligatory feature of this kind of ad. Um, to have that, uh, the tone is slightly different. Of course, the recession coming out of the, the Great Recession uh, was a little more of a sluggish recovery. And so maybe in a nod to that, the Obama campaign in 2012, they kind of acknowledges that it, it tries to say there was a really big uh, challenges inherited. Um, um, but uh, but things are moving again, and and again the same basic argument from Reagan in '84: um, why change course? Why do this? Um, plus the wrinkle in this one, of course, is that it's narrated by uh, one of the world's best narrators, Morgan Freeman. Um, so um, this is a pretty standard approach for come and seeking reelection, and of of course the resonance with the times is not always perfect, as as maybe an element of the Obama version of the ad indicates, and the. This year, we have again an incumbent running for re-election, and I am absolutely certain the, the Trump campaign would have liked to take a page out of the same page out of the playback playbook and run this exact sort of series of campaign ads. But their plans were thwarted um, uh, by uh, the virus and the economic uh, fallout from um, from all that, and so so you won't find a lot of ads like this uh, in 2020. Um, you will find plenty of negative ads in 2020. And I'm not going to show you the 2020 ones because you can see those if you already haven't been inundated with them, but I'll show you two distinct styles of ads that appeal to fear. Um, and so this is a classic example from the George Herbert Walker Bush election campaign, uh, campaign in 1988 um, and uh, an effort to elicit fear where you'll notice that the sounds and images used here are very distinct uh, because the emotions they want to generate are um, are uh, are very distinct. As Governor Michael Dukakis vetoed mandatory sentences for drug dealers, he vetoed the death penalty. His revolving door prison policy gave weekend furloughs to first degree murderers not eligible for furlough. While out, many committed other crimes like kidnapping and rape, and many are still at large. Now, Michael Dukakis says he wants to do for America what he's done for Massachusetts. America can't afford that risk. So this ad is trying to make us anxious, fearful about the threats out there. In this case, an issue often good for that purpose is crime. 
um, and the need for strong law and order policies. And so you'll see a lot of messaging about that this year. Um, uh, but other kinds of threats can be those terrorism, uh, threats to our health. Um, and again, you'll see this year's incumbent uh, and challenger want to um, convince you to be uh, more worried about the other guy uh, and what will happen and, and, and make us feel anxious and fearful about what's to come uh, in order to get us to reconsider our plans, reconsider who we're supporting and, and pay attention to their message. Um, and so that's one style is this kind of symbolic imagery that we see here with the revolving prison door, the barbed wire, and things are grainy and black and white, um, and the ominous kind of sound effects in the background. These are characteristic features of this kind of symbolic fear ad, uh, but there are some other styles of fear ads. And so the last ad I'm gonna show you today um, is an example of a different kind, which uses a dramatization. It kind of puts you in a little mini scene um, uh, and this one comes, uh, most of the ads we're showing you here are presidential ads. This is from a ballot measure in Los Angeles co County back in the early 2000s. Los Angeles County has only one police officer for every 435 residents. Other big cities like New York, Chicago, and Philadelphia have almost twice as many officers per resident. Measure A will provide for more cops and safer streets. Vote yes on Measure A. All right, so they want to put uh, us in the house where the break-ins occurring and and a scared um, woman with her child uh, calling 911, cowering behind the bed, waiting as intruders move the house and ends with you know, hollering uh, at the end. Um, again, to kind of classic homeowner fear of a home invasion um, and play off those fears and in order to make the case here for a directly uh, relevant issue uh, of, of the level of police policing. Um, and uh, this, uh, I was reminded of this particular ad um, this year, because recently in a news story a couple weeks ago, I saw that there was uh, some discussion about um, the Customs and Border Patrol having produced a new ad uh, this year about their function uh, and uh, about the work of the Border Patrol and showed a similar dramatization of um, not actual footage, but stage footage of, of a kind of dramatization of them um, catching people running across the border. One of the individuals escapes. We follow that individual and see them later. They appear um, in an alleyway where they, or a parking lot where they um, end up stabbing uh, someone who's on their cell phone and robbing them um, and run off. And this is a dramatic thing produced by our, our government uh, border patrol um, and the, was in the news because that's an unusual thing for a government agency to produce. Um, but it was exactly in this, um, uh, in, in the kind of style of this, this home evasion ad from, from long ago, Los Angeles. Okay, so this is a way that campaigns, all kinds of campaigns, uh, use advertising techniques to try to evoke particular emotions. Um, and they're a regular part of our campaigns and have been for a long time. Uh, but this year, in the recent past, it may seem like emotions are getting stirred up all the time, and as, as Michael mentioned initially, and not just in ads and conventions. It, it may seem that every personal conversation we have about politics, every social media post or news story has the power to conjure up strong emotions. Um, and that brings me to a second way in which emotions are reaching a high tide lately and, and and that go beyond the normal ebb and flow of, of our election cycles. A phenomenon called affective polarization has been gripping our politics uh, for a variety of reasons. And this mouthful of a term refers to an increasing intensity of feelings among supporters of the two parties, especially in how they feel about each other. Uh, Democrats' dislike for Republicans has been getting stronger, much stronger, more intense uh, in recent years and vice versa. And so I'm showing you some data here from the American National Election Studies, ANES. As an aside, this study has been carried out at Michigan since 1948 um, and is considered the premier study of why and how Americans vote 
Um, as, as Michael mentioned in the, his uh, nice intro, uh, it, it is the longest running, most heavily study of politics in the world, and it's been emulated in dozens of, of other countries. It's uh, something we have a lot of pride, you can tell, um, at the University of Michigan. So these figures actually were produced by my colleague, Shanto Iyengar, who's a professor at Stanford, who co-directs the current ADNS um, project with me. Um, and so ANES invented uh, a measure of liking and disliking um, uh, that we used to, t uh, to uh, tap uh, people's uh, opinions about all kinds of individuals and groups and organizations in our society. Um, and they, they called the feeling thermometer and they invented this back in the 1960s and it's been um, uh, popular ever since as a kind of easy to use measure uh, asking Americans to rate parties, candidates, other groups on um, scales from zero to 100. And so 100 means you really love them, the very warm attitudes, zero means very cold um, and uh, you um, dislike strongly or hate them. Um, and 50 is, is kind of the neutral point. Uh, so this graph shows the trends in responses to that measure over the time from back when the ANS first started asking it towards the two political parties. Um, uh, and groups. And what it's showing you is how people rate the other party, the one that they don't identify with. And specifically, the red line is the share of people in either, uh, either party that rate the other party lower than 50. So in anywhere in the disliking area, and how that's changed over the last 50 plus years in American politics. And you see it's, it's increased dramatically over, it's more than doubled. The number of people who say they dislike. It may be alien to you to, to think that back in the 60s and 70s, Americans, only 20% of Americans rated the other party as, a, as gave them a disliking thing. Uh, a great number were at the neutral point, um, but very few people said they actually disliked the other party uh, when we started this time series, um, and that's changed dramatically, as you can see. The blue line is the share of people rating the other party at the most extreme point at zero. And once this was very rare, only 5% did so when we started, now one in four Democrats or Republicans rate the other party at, at absolute zero. They hate the other party. Right. So um, we could also, this is the same data, but uh, same measure, but now you see the whole distribution um, and looking at just the four previous presidential elections, and you'll notice in the kind of red and greenish um, uh, spaces in uh, where the peak is right near the middle of the graph, um, there's the, the kind of modal point, the peak answer uh, that people gave of, for the other party in 2004 and 2008 uh, was still in the middle. Um, but in the last two elections, the peak is now shifted to being below 10 that somewhere between zero and 10 is the peak um, number of responses. And that's, uh, and that's where things, and, and the whole kind of distribution has moved further into the negative area. So that's just another uh, glance at the same, at the same data. Um, and you can see similar trends if we look not at how people say they feel about the parties, but at the, about the presidential candidates um, uh, from their own party and from um, the opposing party. Um, and you'll notice that the top two lines, which are how the Democrats and Republicans rate their own candidate, hasn't changed that much. That hasn't been going up or down that much. Uh, maybe it went down a little in 2016. There were a couple of people who, um, who had a lot of so-called negatives uh, attached to them, um, generally as uh, by parts of the American public. Um, but in general, there's not really a big trend there for how people have been feeling about their own party, it's been consistently high um, about their own party's candidate. But the attitudes towards the other party's candidates, again, Fazas said, where it was pretty steady for, uh, for a while uh, through the 80s and 90s, um, but again, in the last several elections, it's tailed off. It's dropped off a cliff, um, and, and people that are giving, on average, half the score, half saying they're um, uh, much uh, uh, less favorable towards the other party's candidate. And so that feeling of dislike and, 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 and some might say kind of contempt and hatred for the, for the opposing candidates has, has really changed here. Um, and that's, so that's in a general meter of this kind of affect. Um, but we can also see the same thing if we look at 
questions on specific emotions felt about the presidential candidates, the kinds of specific emotions I was mentioning with the ads. Uh, here, the um, American National Election Studies has asked questions about whether the candidates have ever made you feel those emotions dating back to 1980. Um, and we can see the patterns that it bounces around a little from campaign. This is people who reported their anyone in the whole sample reported these reactions to the Democratic candidates um, over the years. And, and you can see generally enthusiasm is the most popular of people who report a lot. The specific majors ask about hope and pride. And, and usually those are the highest, and they're the highest uh, often, uh, especially when there's an incumbent running. So when we had um, an incumbent office, you, you, uh, a Democratic incumbent, they get higher levels of hope and pride uh, attached to them. Um, and that's more normally the case. Uh, and, and fear is the least common um, um, one reported. But you'll notice in 2016 something happens and uh, all three emotions reach kind of a peak level, um, especially fear and anger towards, in this case, Hillary Clinton, um, are record levels for the entire time series that Annie has been asked in the last 40 years this question. Um, and we can shift to looking at what that distribution looks like for the Republican presidential candidates. And, and here it is. Again, we see the, the most of the peak levels of enthusiasm, um, uh, that dashed line are, are where um, uh, you have uh, an incumbent uh, uh, running, like uh, Reagan in, in 84, um, Bush uh, the Elder in 92, uh, Bush Jr. in, in 2004. And so far, but here in 2016, we again see a divergence. Uh, enthusiasm not quite as high, uh, but there's not a Republican incumbent. Um, uh, but fear and anger through the roof. Um, uh, way way higher average scores relative to past years, and so this is part of the ramping up of the emotions that you may have detected in 2016. Um, that was uh, brought out by this trend of effect, affective polarization and maybe also by the particular um, um, characteristics and the emotions evoked by the specific two candidates running in 2016. And, uh, and so I want to conclude um, just by noting what evidence, uh, what some of the evidence suggests are the implications from this high tide of affective polarization we're feeling. Uh, and some of this might help make sense of some of what you think you see it happening around you. Um, and so uh, one thing, one implication of this is that uh, party loyalty, when, when people feel this so much stronger about the candidates, the party loyalty um, is, in, is even stronger than in normal times. And it's normally a fairly strong force. Partisanship has normally uh, been a strong force in our, our politics, but it's even stronger, uh, fewer defections, fewer split ticket voting, um, um, and, and stronger taking of cues from party leaders, in, in terms of if if my if the leader if the leader of my party um, uh, changes their position on some issue or adopts some position on some on some issue, um, that often is influential for supporters. But it's even more influential under these conditions. The research shows uh, it does up uh, levels of political engagement and participation. Uh, that is, partisans are. Um, even more attentive, they're more involved in campaigns, they're more likely to turn out, and so we've seen a, 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 a bump um, in turnout uh, in, um, in recent elections, in the, in the last several elections, relative to what it had been in the 80s and 90s, um, um, and especially the 2018 midterms uh, um, was the highest level of turnout in a midterm by far in a, a century. Um, so you do see this uh, a bump up in turnout from partisans, but not a, as big a turnout as we might see, and not as big a boost, if there weren't an offsetting effect that this polarized politics has an impact on those who are fairly disinterested and who are independent, who view themselves as independents and as not partisans. It tends, that group of people tends to be turned off by all of this uh, strong emotional partisan loyalty uh, happening around them. And they uh, are increasingly likely to shut out politics um, which has the vicious cycle problem of leaving those who remain in politics even more polarized. The, the people in the middle are, are abandoning politics. 
during this period. Um, and a, a last set of implications is that what we see uh, whenever identities strongly polarized like this, uh, including in the partisan cases, increased um, social distancing. Um, uh, that is, people want to stay away from, have very little to do with people from the other party in a way that isn't true in less polarized times. Um, and this has led in the current period to strains even within families, fractured friendship networks, literally defriending people on social media uh, as ramifications. Sociologists have talked about social distancing for a long time. They don't want to live uh, uh, near people in the, in, a, in the kind of disliked out group. You don't like to, you don't want them living next door to you um, and, and people want distance. Um, and another thing that happens is um, kind of increase in incivility and even dehumanization of the enemy uh, as they're come to scene. And so we see an increase in rudeness, a, a kind of in your face style of political conversation um, during these heightened polarization periods and, and seeing references to the other side as enemies of the people, as mindless animals, evil monsters. This is how we talk of the dehumanized term. And that has, uh, it's not just purely rhetoric, thinking about and talking about other groups as uh, in these de this dehumanized way um, makes it easier to commit violence and, um, and to attack and, and do mean and unfair things to the other side if, if because they're, they're monsters and they're animals and they have it coming. So on that cheery note, uh, that's all I wanted to say uh, about uh, it was a little um, a window into what's happening with our politics, and I'm happy to talk about that stuff or anything else people would like to raise about the about the election. Well, thank you so much, Ted. That was from the, from the those old ads um, at, up until sort of capturing what's happening at this current moment. That was great. We have a lot of questions rolling in. Um, we'll try and get through as many as we can for those of you who haven't had a chance to. Um, submit yours yet, you can do that by using the Q&A function on the bottom of your screen. Um, so Ted, you use the term social distancing to refer to political polarization, and that is a, a good segue to the first question I want to pose to you. Um, we had an attendee ask, I hear people say that they are frustrated that the pandemic has become a political hot topic, but considering the amount of emotions associated with it, namely fear, I wonder if it's any surprise. Why do you think COVID has become so politicized? It's a great question and certainly one that's important for what's happening in the country right now. I think partly it is um, because uh, in this polarized atmosphere, anything basically that one of the parties or the party's de facto leader touches becomes uh, contaminated with this polarization. And so there's a temptation always, if, if you're in a strong rivalry, if you're in a strong state of polarization between two groups, when one group does something, the natural inclination of the other group is to take the opposite position. Um, and even if it really isn't related to why they were competing in the first place, even if we might think it's not. So, so from time to time, you see issues that maybe seem like they ought to be a, the subject of science, of health, of, of sports, of commerce, become politicized. And, and not every issue yet in our society has been politicized, but increasingly so many are. And, um, and I show actually my class um, as to illustrate this, uh, a, a slide with a, um, opinions about uh, back in, in 2012 about, uh, or it was actually in 2011, during the early stages of the primary process, um, attitudes towards or ratings of Godfather's Pizza, brand of pizza chain um, through uh, parts of the South and Midwest especially, um, that, uh, that in partisan differences in rating Godfather's Pizza. And there weren't partisan differences because why would there be partisan differences in rating pizza? Uh, a specific brand of pizza, no less. Um, and for the first five months of the year, there was no differences. And all of a sudden, in May of that year, 
the Republicans started liking Godfather's Pizza a better, and Democrats uh, started disliking it more. And what happened? Uh, a man by the name of Herman Cain, who unfortunately died this year from the coronavirus, uh, got entered as a Republican candidate for, for president um, in, in uh, May of that year. And he got a lot of attention, both because he was one of those candidates who was particularly effective at delivering frank, punchy lines during the, the early debates. Um, and he was an African-American, which is relatively rare for uh, the candidates in, uh, in the Republican presidential primaries. And so he got a lot of attention from that. Um, and whenever anyone talked about it, he happened to be the former CEO of Godfather's Pizza. That was his kind of main credential. He'd been a businessman and he had been CEO. He was the former CEO of Godfather's Pizza. But that's the thing they always said about him because it was his kind of leading resume credential. And that association got put in people's mind. Herman Cain, Republican, Godfather's Pizza, it got repeated a lot. And, and it led to people disliking or rating the brand Godfather's Pizza less if they were Democrats, more better if it were Republicans. And Godfather's Pizza didn't have anything to do with it. Uh, so, so that's an example, I mean, it's just a minor, rather trivial compared to talking about the coronavirus, um, uh, but an example of how even, even when it comes to a trivial issue, it can, things can become polarized in this, in this atmosphere. And so it's, it's, un, it's unfortunate because I think uh, if we could step back from this process, a lot of us would say, we wish these things uh, could be, um, nonpartisan. Yeah, I think we do feel that way, many of us. Um, so, Ted, you talked about a little bit about the um, the effect of polarization on independence, um, but we have an interesting question here about how um, research might indicate the ways that emotion and emotionally driven advertising is affecting what is whatever is left of sort of those who would call themselves moderates. Um, sure, sure. It, in in a way, um, that's a it's a tricky group uh, because it's you know campaigns. It's easy to know how to pull the strings of your supporters or your opponents uh, emotionally because they are stro strongly emotionally tied to a, a, a side. Um, and so independents are a bit uh, trickier. These are people who are generally less engaged about politics to begin with. Even, even those who still make a regular habit of voting are, tend not to be as worked up about politics. And so, so how do you get their emotions? And I think you focus on uh, their, uh, primarily on their concerns uh, about, you try to focus on key uh, concerns they have in their lives, often things like healthcare, um, 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 their jobs, economy, and you talk about the anxieties they have. Um, and those things can still resonate, of course, because people, they, they do feel like they have a stake in those things, uh, pay, paying their, their medical bills uh, or their, their, worry, their worries about being able to do so. Um, and, and so campaigns try to, um, try to use that to, to make the case for the policies they want their candidate is advancing. Um, and so, so, so definitely independents are, uh, these tactics are used to try to get votes from all parts of the electorate, including independents, um, but the strategies can look a little bit different um, in trying to do so. And, and just the Reagan ad as well, right? Sometimes it's the raw, raw for my team enthusiasm, but the Reagan ad was about things are going well for the whole country. It was about America. There was no discussion of political parties in that ad. Um, and so and there wasn't much discussion of anything approaching ideological issues. It was really just about the state of the country. And again, that, that could have broader appeal that extends beyond partisan boundaries. You mentioned um, just now the Reagan ad and, and we had an interesting question sort of in this moment when our country is focused on racial justice, um, you know, kind of a renewed focus on that important topic um, we had a question from Susan um, observing that there are very few Black, Hispanic, and Asian people in those ads that you showed. Um, she noticed that um, in some cases, the African Americans were the ones who were painting fences and washing cars and asked for your comments on that. Yeah, it, um, that's true. That's true. That's, uh, I think the, the group, especially in the Reagan ad um, back in 84, looks, uh, looks very 
uh, white and middle class, a really, really kind of small town America kind of image. And I think that's a lot of how they may have seen their base um, and their effort to win over people like here in Michigan, the so-called Reagan Democrats, the, the white suburban voters in Macomb and Oklahoma counties in Michigan. Um, and, and so I think that's how they saw it. You, you know, you, they, they're probably self-conscious enough that they put in the one or two uh, minority um, individuals uh, who, you know, they're smiling, they're happy to be painting the fence, but that's, uh, uh, so you see that uh, the, the ads um, get better diversity, but yeah, it's, up, uh, it's not as egregious. You can go way back in advertising the, the very first political television ads in the 50s and the Eisenhower and uh, Ally Stevenson campaigns and see that um, they, when they had, when they featured women, the women were bringing in the groceries or uh, they pausing from vacuuming to talk to the audience at home. Um, it very, says a lot about the gender roles and about the predominant norms and who's, who's serving what role, who's, concerns are center most in the minds of the candidates and the parties at that time. So, um, and so you do see these changes over time and, um, uh, you know, and, and that the neglect of the interests of those groups is part of what's um, coming home to roost um, lately. So I really like this question. Um, you know, some people listening today may be wondering what can we as individuals do to help counter affective polarization? Um, there's a comment that says, it seems like this is harmful to our society's well being. So, what can we do, in your opinion? Um, that's a great question. Uh, it's, it's very difficult to know what to do, you know, on any grand scale to change this, it's, since it's really running the whole through our whole system. Um, and uh, it may take something rather dramatic to break our political parties out of this, but there are undoubtedly things people can do uh, at the individual level to, to ratchet down the tensions locally. And one of those things is to be more conscious and aware that this is happening. And the fact that so recognize that this is a tendency that runs strongly on both sides um, that it's something that can motivate us and to catch ourselves and step back when we're going to be so quick to dismiss the other side or say this does not mean you have to embrace everything your political adversaries say. Um, it, 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 it doesn't uh, require that, but it, it can, uh, uh, it means though uh, being a little more listened, especially, you know, in your own social networks or in your own social media. Uh, conversations and uh, you know where you maybe occasionally when you see something that uh, you recognize as a legitimate concern uh, from the other side from someone on the other side or um, or a legitimate point they make uh, you know make an effort to say so do that thing that we Americans were much better at a couple decades ago which is reaching across the divide, finding commonalities. There is still bitter policy differences and, and, um, and strong enthusiasm for their own side back then, but, um, but these are things that can be done to step back. And it isn't easy to do because you can see these friends, these acquaintances, and they are supporting the other candidate and you're like, how could they? And uh, I don't even want to talk with like, so you've got to, do what you can at an individual level and that might help um, on a grand scale for us they can at least help make things a little more human and 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 uh, tolerable in your local networks uh, what's going to be required to break the political parties out of this cycle could be something dramatic it may take the fracturing or um, change in the in the w the parties themselves um, and um, so we, we don't have an easy answer to that. If we did, we'd be out there offering it. Right. Well, I, I see a question just came in um, from Frederick Kahn on this, on this topic. Um, and I know we're, we're running out of time, but I wanna try and squeeze this one and one more in. Um, he asks, would a system with more than two parties increase political participation and improve 
the ability to reach compromises and produce legislation? Um, it would, uh, a lot of people are interested in that, comparing across democracies. Um, um, it, it's quite possible it would increase participation. Um, people who feel they're quite distant from either of the two parties um, might feel um, uh, attracted, to, uh, uh, like there's something more they can get enthusiastic by, which tends to lead people to vote more. Uh, but um, whether it would lead to more um, uh, compromise and getting things done, it's less clear. It, it could because if no one party's done it, then people have to work together, and that's simply a reality if no one party has a majority. Um, on the other hand, it can be quite fractious, and so you have places like Israel, which currently have um, a, a dozen or more viable uh, parties that get representation in the national legislature there, um, and they're they've been going in cycles and back and forth and having a lot of difficulties too. So, so it, it, it can have some positive effects, but it's, it's maybe not a, a one shot panacea for, for everything. Right. Okay. Um, we've got our last question here. Apologies if we weren't able to touch on yours today, but this is, um, this is a bit of sort of a shift. Um, we know you don't have a crystal ball, um, but Mitch asks, given how the 2016 election polls missed their mark, how much stock should we put into the current polling, which shows a sizable lead for Biden? Um, I think that's a great question, and it's one on, on just about everyone's mind, including the pollsters themselves. Um, that is to say that I think one should take things with a grain of salt, uh, keeping in mind that, that in 2016, the national polls were actually very accurate. Um, they were within a percentage point of Clinton's ultimate percentage of the vote. Um, but the state polls were off in some states more than others. And one big reason people think is because they, education has become to matter in predicting Democrat versus Republican votes in a different way, in a stronger way than it had for many years. And, and that low, less educated, individuals, but not necessarily lower income, uh, were much more likely to support Donald Trump and the Republican Party. And those sa that same group of people is also less likely to take part in polls and surveys um, and then college educated individuals. And so they were being missed and a lot of polls were not waiting. They were waiting by race and gender and age in 2016, but they weren't waiting, waiting their data by uh, by education to compensate for not having enough educated people. And this this could make a, a, a few percentage point difference in the poll. So that's one thing they're doing. But there is some data out there that suggests that even when they started doing that in 2018, some of the state polls were still off. Um, a different factor that's out there is the, uh, that might mean the polls aren't as far off this year is, is the, is um, the, uh, how does uh, describe the with the presence of third party candidates that are are really attracting much attention and undecideds because of the high negatives on Clinton and Trump there were a lot of undecideds a lot of people flirting with voting for third parties in the end those people a lot of those people in the last two weeks went made a decision to go for either Trump or Clinton and far more of them went for um, for Trump though the number of people in that group is much smaller this year's and you've seen a very stable race. That said, things are still very close in a number of battleground states and you'd rather be Joe Biden and be up in the polls than Donald Trump if on the polling, but I don't think, I don't think Joe Biden or his campaign are sleeping easy uh, and taking things for granted at the moment. Okay, well that concludes our Q&A. Um, as well as our presentation on behalf of all of us at the University of Michigan. I wanna thank Michael Hefter for his introduction. Professor Ted Brader, thank you so much. Your expertise is so valuable at this particular moment and your presentation was very informative. I think we all have takeaways from it. And to thank our audience, all of you, we had over 90 people joining us today. So thank you for joining, um, asking thoughtful questions and engaging in today's talk. Um, Please be on the lookout for an email in your inbox asking you to fill out a brief survey so we can get your feedback as we begin planning the next Michigan and Manhattan event. 
That email will also contain contact information for Sarah Michaels and me. We're the two who reside and work for U of M right here in the region, in case you'd like to be in touch with us. And of course, we hope that you will join us again for the next Michigan and Manhattan. Thank you again for attending today. Special thanks again to Ted and Michael and go blue.